As we saw with the upper limb, the lower limb can be divided into a series of compartments with muscles performing similar functions and a designated neurovascular supply. We start with a compartment that is more of a transition between the torso and the lower limb. This is the gluteal region. Welcome back to today's final session. In the second session, we discuss the framework of bones that make up the hip girdle. In this final session, we look at the muscles and the neurovascular supply to the gluteal region. This can be thought of as a transition region between the torso and the lower limb, just as the shoulder girdle contain muscles that anchor the scapula and the humerus to the ribs and the vertebrae, the pelvic girdle is made up in part of muscles that anchor the femur to the pelvic bones previously discussed. Anatomically, it's still considered part of the trunk, but the muscles in this region all act upon the femur across the hip, which is why we waited until now to discuss this region. We'll be taking an in-depth look at each of these muscles in turn, and then considering the neurovascular supply to the gruleal region. We'll also take a few minutes to talk about a specific clinical gait pattern known as the Trendelenburg sign. We can now look at the muscles of the gluteal region. The region can be divided into superficial and deep regions. We'll start with the superficial gluteal muscles. The most prominent muscle in the gluteal region which also happens to be the thickest muscle in the body, is the aptly named gluteus maximus. It has an incredibly broad origin off the lateral aspect of the sacrum, the medial aspect of the ilium, bordered by the posterior gluteal line, and the sacrotuberous ligament. The fibers then project infralaterally to insert on the iliotibial band from posteriorly. This insertion continues to extend inferiorly to the gluteal tuberosity on the posterior aspect of the femur. The gluteus maximus contracts to generate a rather forceful extension of the hip joint from a flex joint position, such as rising from a chair or climbing upstairs. The muscle shows minimum activation while walking on a level surface. In this situation, we place greater reliance on the hip extensors in the posterior compartment of the thigh. The muscle is also a powerful external rotator of the hip. Gluteus maximus is supplied by the inferior gluteal neurovascular bundle, which will be discussed later. Deep to the gluteus maximus is gluteus medius. It originates off the outer surface of the ilium between the posterior and anterior gluteal lines. The muscle then inserts on the posterior aspect of the greater trochanter. It is supplied by the superior gluteal neurovascular bundle. Deep to the gluteus medius is gluteus minimus muscle. It originates off the gluteal surface of the ilium inferior to the inferior gluteal lines to insert on the anterior aspect of the greater trochanter. Like the gluteus medius, it is also supplied by the superior gluteal neurovascular bundle. The actions of gluteus medius and minimus can be a bit confusing based on the two-dimensional pictures in your book. From the posterior view, one gets the impression that the gluteus medius might actually be an extensor and a lateral rotator of the thigh. In reality, because of the way that it wraps anterior to the hip joint, it is an abductor of the hip as well as a medial rotator. You can verify this by standing and palpating the fleshy material posterior and slightly inferior to the anterior superior leg spine. Now with your feet firmly planted, try to inwardly rotate at the hips to try and make yourself go pigeon-toed. Now if you do this properly, you should feel the muscle mass bulge under your hand. That's the gluteus medius muscle that you're palpating. We normally speak of the abduction properties of the gluteus medius and minimus, which brings to mind someone bringing out their leg to the side, similar to what is seen at the shoulder. In this scenario, we think of the horizontal axis of the pelvis remaining fixed, and the vertical axis of the femur is pulled out to the side. And if we were to look at this as a vector diagram, this is certainly the case. But consider the horizontal axis of the pelvis for a moment. Not so horizontal in this position, is it? This is because of the pull of the contralateral hip abductors. In other words, the gluteus medius and minimus on the other side. In this case, however, note that the vertical shaft of the humerus is in a fixed position and it's the horizontal pelvic axis which is in motion. This motion is of critical importance during normal gait. 
As we walk, there are periods where only a single leg is in direct contact with the ground, similar to what is seen when standing on one leg. In this position, note that the pelvis is level, or even somewhat elevated on the contralateral side. This is due to the action of the gluteus medius and minimus. Without the contraction of the muscles on the stance side of the body, the weight of the torso will tilt towards the hips on the up-supported side of the body. This can create some serious disruptions in gait. Here we see the case of an elderly woman with spinal nerve compression on her left side that has resulted in weakness in her left hip abductors. This causes the hip to dip down to the right when standing unsupported on her left leg. The gait pattern is known as the Trendelenburg gait or Trendelenburg sign for the physician that first studied the phenomenon. The condition can be resulted from paralysis, muscle strain, chronic abductor pain, or any condition that prevents maximal activation of the hip abductor muscles. An additional muscle to discuss is the tensor fascia lata. It's a fusiform muscle originating off the iliac crest with a unique insertion. The inferior portion of the muscle tapers and the connective tissues blend with the fascia lata to form the previously mentioned iliotibial band. The fascia lata continues to the knee, where it inserts in the anterolateral region of the tibia, referred to as Gertie's tubercle. It contracts to tighten the fascia of the thigh and provides a mild contribution to hip flexion. Although it is oriented more with the anterior muscle group, it's supplied by the superior gluteal neurovascular bundle and is therefore considered a product of the gluteal region. The next muscle on our list for identification is the piriformis. Piriformis is a Latin term to describe the shape of a pear. While we only see the narrow insertion of the piriformis in the lab initially, it broadens like a pear as it projects through the greater sciatic foramen and approaches its origin off the internal surface of the sacrum. The muscle inserts on the greater trochanter medial to the insertion of gluteus medius and minimus and serves as a lateral rotator of the hip. As we will later discuss, piriformis is an important landmark for several neurovascular structures. We can now look at the deeper muscles in the gluteal region. First is the obturator internus, which, as the name implies, originates off the internal surface of the obturator foramen and membrane. The muscle winds posteriorly and takes a 90 degree turn to project laterally to insert in the trochanteric fossa along with the obturator externus. On its path, it's joined by two additional muscles, the superior and inferior gemelles, or twin muscles, which originate from the ischial spine and tuberosity superior and inferior to the tendon for obturator internus. The last muscle in this group is the quadratus femoris, which originates from the furrow between the ischial tuberosity and acetabular fossa to insert between the greater and lesser trochanters. Collectively, these muscles combine with piriformis to laterally rotate the hip. In addition to their obvious role in movement of the femur, the muscles of the gluteal region also serve as important landmarks in identifying important neurovascular components within the gluteal region. Of particular importance is the piriformis muscle, which exits through the greater sciatic foramen. The superior and inferior borders of this muscle normally mark the boundaries of a number of important neurovascular structures. To give a better understanding of the origin of these vessels, we need to take a brief look at the vasculature within the pelvic cavity. This is something that we will return to during the final unit of the course, when we actually open the abdominal pelvic cavity to look at the internal organs. Even though we won't be able to see the origin of these vessels just yet, it still helps to give a conceptual view of the vessel's origin in order to gain a better understanding of their position in the gluteal region. In the left-hand diagram, we can see the terminal portion of the descending aorta as it branches into the left and right common iliac vessels. A little further down, we see another major split in the common iliac artery. Projecting more anteriorly, we have the external iliac artery. This passes deep to the inguinal canal to enter the leg as the femoral artery, which supplies the anterior compartment of the thigh and pretty much everything below the knee. We'll be taking a closer look at this branch in tomorrow's lesson. Running more posteriorly is the internal iliac branch, which branches extensively to supply the various organs of the pelvic cavity. In addition, several of these branches exit the pelvic cavity to supply the gluteal region. First is the superior gluteal artery, which passes over the superior border of the piriformis muscle, 
primarily supplying the gluteus medius, minimus, and tensor fascia lata muscles. Two other branches that come off the trunk supplying the superior gluteal artery include the obturator artery and the inferior gluteal artery. The obturator artery passes through the obturator canal we discussed in the previous session to enter the medial compartment of the thigh. Again, we'll discuss this more in the upcoming lesson on the anterior and medial thigh. The inferior gluteal artery, as you may have expected, passes inferior to the piriformis muscle to primarily supply the gluteus maximus muscle. One final branch to discuss that appears briefly in our study of the gluteal compartment is the internal pudendal artery. This emerges with the inferior gluteal artery through the greater sciatic foramen, inferior to the piriformis muscle. Unlike the inferior gluteal artery, however, the internal pudendal artery dives back through the lesser sciatic foramen, winding anteriorly along the medial aspect of the obturator internus muscle to supply blood to the pelvis and perineum, which includes the anal canal and external genitalia. We also see a number of nerves projecting in and through the gluteal region, many of which are named similar to the arteries. The superior gluteal nerve branches follow the paths of the superior gluteal arterial branches and supply the same structures, the gluteus medius and minimus, and the tensor fascia lata. The same trend is seen with the inferior gluteal vessels and nerve, which supply the gluteus maximus. Further medial, we find the pudendal nerve coursing through an expanse of fascia projecting from the obturator internus called the pudendal canal. This is the nerve supplied to the perineum or pelvic floor and will be revisited in the final unit of the course. Several other neurovascular structures emerge inferior to the piriformis. Probably the most distinct is the sciatic nerve, which projects inferior to enter the posterior compartment of the thigh. Now, although the sciatic nerve is one of the most clinically referenced nerves in the body due to its role in back pain, it's actually not a distinct nerve, but rather a combination of two cell smaller nerves that are bundled together as they pass through the gluteal region and posterior compartment. Imagine wrapping your index and middle finger together in athletic tape and you'll get an idea. The components of the sciatic nerve course through the posterior compartment of the thigh and branches to supply all compartments in the lower leg. We'll return to this structure numerous times over the next few lessons. Medial to the sciatic nerve is the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. Although it is strictly a superficial nerve branch, it is quite distinctive due to its relatively large size. In addition, we also see two small nerve branches directly from the sacral plexus. These are the nerve to obturator internus, which also supplies the superior gemellus, and the nerve to quadratus femoris, which also supplies the inferior gemellus. That does it for this segment on the gluteal region. Next up, we'll move our way further into the lower limb by looking at the anterior and lateral compartments of the thigh. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.